All right, so today we're going to be talking about a uh, methodology for auditing, uh, in this case, uh, endpoint security products. Uh, the particular use case that we'll be referring to is Sysmon here, but really the methodology that we cover uh, could absolutely be applied to any endpoint security product out there. So we're definitely not here today to pick on Sysmon per se, uh, some of the tradecraft and bypasses and evasions that we'll talk about will absolutely apply to other products. So my name is Matt Graber. I'm a security researcher at Spectre Ops. Uh, I've also been involved in a good amount of threat hunting work recently, which I really enjoy. Um, traditionally, uh, more offensively minded, but getting to apply that uh, in a threat, threat hunting scenario has been a ton of fun and has been really eye-opening uh, and really serves to make me a better uh, red teamer. So uh, I also really enjoy burning tradecraft publicly. Um, I would rather, uh, you know, nation state adversaries not have complete control over tradecraft. Not to say that, you know, ours is the caliber of nation states, but anything that we can get out there, we try to be as transparent as possible, uh, which will include some of the tradecraft that we'll cover today. My name is Lee Christensen. Uh, I am a security researcher and uh, operator at Spectre Ops. So things that includes is red teaming, threat, hunt, uh, threat hunting, and I just do uh, security research uh, when I can. So I really like shiny security things, whatever it may be. Uh, that's why I, I, I hold no allegiance to the red or blue side. Uh, just any fascinating security product that's out there, uh, I like to go after. And some of you may be wondering why we're wearing these ridiculous outfits. Well, uh, this is all for charity. Uh, and we have some big thank yous that we need to throw out for, uh, we have Barry Blowdart on Twitter for kicking off the charity event, uh, Dave Kennedy and, the, and uh, Skip Duckwall for some major contributions. And of course, thanks to everybody who contributed to the charity drive. Uh, this is for MDA. We'll have a link at the end, but if any of you feel free, uh, feel free to contribute to the charity. It's something that's dear to us and our team. So appreciate any donations. Just so you know, this is like really awkward for us. Like we're not the types who usually yeah. like beg for attention, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do as much as we can uh, within reason to support a uh, good cause. So what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to start off talking about the goals of an, of an evasive adversary. Uh, we're going to present the detection, a typical detection methodology, and then we're going to present the subversion, de uh, subverting detection methodology. Uh, dive into why we're targeting Sysmon. We're going to, since Sysmon is a data collector, we're going to talk about some subversion strategy, strategies for data collectors, then wrap up with some conclusions from our research. Goals of an evasive adversary. So ultimately, the goal of an adversary of an evasive adversary is to avoid detection at an organizational level. So if AV fail, if AV catches something and it's not forwarded to the back end to where the SOC can analyze it, that means detection has failed because the adversary is going undetected from an organizational level. Uh, this can be accomplished by blending in with normal, uh, by exploiting defender biases when they're, when they're writing detection rules, uh, avoiding, and, and in general, just avoiding human eyes altogether. So if we can subvert the de detection tools or data sources, then we will be successful as an evasive adversary. So ultimately, subverting security solutions really is just an engineering challenge of more mature adversaries. So as a red teamer um, of a sufficient maturity level, you really should be trying to emulate that. So I know some vendors will certainly be sensitive about researchers uh, showing off bypasses for their specific product. We're more about showing general uh, evasive techniques that can apply to one or many security products. Um, so if the adversaries are doing that, then if we want to deliver value to our customers or any defenders out there as well, um, or if a red teamer just wants, yeah, if a red teamer wants to provide as much value as possible, then they should be doing these same things and identifying the key terrain in their target environment and having evasions prepared. So like we said, ultimately a, an organization wants to be able to, de to detect 
attacker ta uh, detect attacker attacker activity uh, inside of their network. So what goes into building out a detection? Because that's going to influence us if we're trying to subvert it. So an at a generalized adversary detection methodology is you identify an, at an attack technique. So this could be a lateral move, a specific lateral movement technique or privilege escalation technique. You find a data source that may uh, inform you or that may provide data about when that technique occurs. So that could be like process, when a process is created. Uh, it could come from something like an ETW provider. Uh, then you have to actually have a tool that will do this collection. So in this, Sysmon fits this case. It is a data collection tool. So we're going to apply a strategy to subverting that data collection tool. And I did just want to highlight that Sysmon is not, we wouldn't consider it to be like a full-fledged endpoint security product. It really is just a data collector that can be used to supplement existing or additional data sources. Yeah. And that brings us right into the next step of the detection methodology, which is transport. So this can take place within an uh, endpoint solution itself or the transport of events from an endpoint to a backend analysis system like a SIM. Uh, so, and then there's enrichment and analysis that goes on with any events that are transported. Uh, and then there's some sort of classification, whether it's malicious, suspicious, or benign. Uh, and then, of course, if it, it is malicious or maybe suspicious, there's going to be some sort of alert. Maybe there's a, a blocking action as a response. Uh, this could also occur, like with antivirus, if there's an alert, it may write it to an event log. And then that event log will be transported, hopefully, eventually back to the backend uh, SIM. So as just as we have these you know, seven steps for a detection methodology, those exact same steps inform our subversion methodology. So essentially the detection subversion methodology is evading or tampering with any of the steps of the detection methodology. So instead of, uh, as a converse to the first step, an attacker can select specific techniques that the target organization may not be aware of. They may uh, they may subvert data sources, so they could disable a specific ETW provider if that's being used to, fund, to generate the data. Uh, the, they could subvert the data collection tool, so suspending the tool or, or killing off the process. And ETW like, is kind of all the rage with a lot of specific vendors out there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, disable, an attacker may also take the approach of subverting the transport of that, that data, so uh, disabling a log forwarder. Uh, you know, uh, the classification engine, uh, say there's a specific signature, so AV is a classic example of this. Uh, it's very much signature based, so we just have to bypass the signature, and that, that's the component. We're, we're attacking the classification component there, and then alerting and response. So can we somehow prevent an alert from ever being uh, sent off to the SOC to be analyzed? So we could disable a log forwarder, if that's what they're using to, ship, uh, to essentially ship off that, or we could use a firewall to block any communication of the endpoint to backend alerting systems. So it sounds like what you're referring to is like, a macro and a micro evasion strategy, yeah? Yep, exactly. So you have, at a micro level, you have what's occurring on an endpoint or some other part of the network. But if, if detection occurs there, the, the overall goal of the organization at de, uh, identifying that there's an attacker is not complete. So the endpoint alerting has occurred, but somehow that uh, that alert needs to also be transported to the back end so that SOC, the SOC and the security team at an organizational level becomes aware of the detection as well. So you can subvert it at the micro level on the endpoint, so you can subvert detection there. And if you can also uh, subvert detection at the macro level of, pre of preventing the SOC or the organization from knowing about the alert, then you, you are successful as an attacker. So we found that categorizing um, the holistic evasion methodology as such, or the detection methodology as such, is although while each of these events may seem obvious and intuitive, uh, we tend to like to have them written out because uh, each category will have separate evasion strategies and, and tactics evolved, uh, uh, involved in each one of them. 
So what was our rationale for targeting Sysmon specifically? Again, defenders use it heavily. I know of some vendors that actually take dependencies on it, uh, some of which uh, those products we've run into in, uh, in enterprises. Um, so again, we're not here to pick on Sysmon per se. We actually have a lot of nice things to say. Um, and some of the tradecraft that we'll cover bypasses not only, or evades and bypasses not only Sysmon, but is likely to evade other products as well. So we're gonna specifically focus on data collector subversion strategies. Like we mentioned, Sysmon is a data collector, so that fits in right with step three uh, in, that date, uh, in the detection methodology. Um, so we're gonna apply some strategies that we've come up with to subvert data collectors. Um, our interest as attackers is tampering, evasion opportunities, and any part of the attack surface that we could take advantage of, so if there's any vulnerabilities. In our experience, most vendors uh, tend to focus on the attack surface analysis, maybe pay attention to the tampering part of it, uh, but very few are paying attention to or putting a lot of research into the evasion aspect of things as well. They so, acknowledge the, the Tavis threat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're, we're gonna focus on the data collector since Sysmon is that. Uh, the strategies we will be talking about are, you know, number one, familiarization and scoping of your, of your research, uh, data source resilience auditing, footprint and attack service analysis, uh, data collection implementation analysis, and the configuration of the tool. So that, that type of analysis. So step number one, tool familiarization and scoping. Uh, a big part of this is just understanding what the purpose of the tool is uh, and understanding the guarantees. So what do we mean by guarantees? Uh, this is tampering guarantees under which circumstances can at an attacker, uh, or does a product protect protect against an attacker, and also the collection guarantees of that tool. So what events does the, the tool claim that it is uh, collecting, and does it do so correct, uh, correctly? Uh, and then understanding the threat models, so kind of going along with that tampering guarantee, what type of attacker is the tool uh, sec uh, secure against? Uh, so is this a low privilege attacker? Is it an administrator? Is it somebody in the kernel? Uh, which, which aspect of attack or what type of attacker does uh, the product protect against? And in general, uh, just getting comfortable with the tool. So in, in just installing it, configuring it, using it, seeing how it's used as a, from an or, uh, inside of an organization. So Sysmon, taking the same approach. Sysmon is a user mode activity uh, sensor. So it's not gonna be monitoring things inside of the kernel, that's not its purpose. Uh, it it's functions as a standalone executable and driver, that's how it implements this, uh, these components. Uh, there isn't any sort of centralized deployment and configuration management. Uh, most organizations are gonna end up deploying it through some third party tool. Uh, it could be SCCM, could be GPO, uh, name your favorite tool. Uh, there are. Like Matt mentioned, there's no analysis capabilities inside of Sysmon. It's a data collector. You write data collection rules. Analysis takes place uh, in, with your detection rules inside of something like a, a, a sim. Notice that Lee mentioned data collection rules versus detection rules. That's an important distinction, I think. And again, the guarantees of Sysmon is that it's resistant against a non-administrator. So once an attacker becomes admin, all other protections that it has in place are no longer guaranteed. Uh, in addition, those data sources from which uh, Sysmon pulls events, uh, it, it has guarantees that it is comprehensively collecting those uh, at, unless there are filtering rules in place. So this is important because Backend SOC analysts are assuming that everything that Sysmon is reporting is the, the whole picture, that nothing is being filtered and that it's comprehensive. So that's the guarantee that Sysmon is making unless there's filtering rules in place. So data source, data source resilience auditing, this is a critical step uh, that we would take when assessing a new product, in this case Sysmon. So the questions that we would ask ourselves are one, 
what events and event fields does this product capture? And of those event fields and event types that exist, what of those can be directly or indirectly influenced by an evasive attacker? And finally, what fields do defenders typically use when building collection rules? Because armed with that knowledge, we can exploit uh, naive uh, detection or uh, rule creation uh, methodology that your, your typical defender might have. So first, we would look at uh, whether or not there are generic rule evasions. Uh, so we'd have to identify what can be logged and what attributes of the event can be, can be influenced. So Sysmon supports all of the following event types. So you actually have some pretty good coverage and it uh, is pretty understandable why defenders really like Sysmon because it really is an outstanding supplementary source of event data. So I'm gonna go through a more detailed example covering process create in just a moment. Um, but our methodology would be looking through each of these event types. For example, we'll cover WIMI events soon and uh, we have a new generic WIMI event evasion such that it would never be logged in the first place. For things that are not directly under our control, uh, we could fall back to either influencing what fields can be modified by us um, or exploit the rule engine itself. So if we get access to a configuration, we can build an evasion strategy that is specific to that configuration. So one thing I wanted to mention was, for example, the image load event type. One of the fields that it captures is signature related information. For a long time, and maybe up until now, a lot of defenders still assume that it is a non-trivial process or not even possible to uh, evade uh, signature analysis, whereby you'd have something indicating that a signature is valid and say that it is signed by Microsoft. So both of those aspects of code signing can be completely subverted. Uh, and there's uh, various types of attacks. Uh, I, I have a, a white paper that covers uh, one such class of attacks where uh, signature analysis can be completely evaded. So I just want to mention that. But let's dive into process create uh, events specifically. Now, this, uh, this diagram that I have here, just be mindful, it's extremely subjective. The column on the left in the green is the, uh, are the fields that are directly influenceable by an attacker. Now, the reason uh, it's subjective is because, you know, this could certainly depend on uh, your initial point of entry, whether you came from an exploit, a macro, where, uh, post-exploitation factors might not be directly in influenceable. Um, this was developed more um, from the perspective of a true post-exploitation scenario. So a column in the middle um, could potentially be influenced by an attacker and then the red ones, generally, generally speaking, uh, you don't have much control, if at all, over any of those. Now, I didn't just blindly accept that those in the red would not be directly influenceable. For example, um, there was a time when I didn't understand how the process GUID was actually built until I reversed the, the Sysmon service and learned that is actually comprised of uh, the machine GUID, which can be retrieved from the registry. So if you wanted to tamper with that, you would, you'd have to be admin. Um, the time of process start and also the token ID. So I had to understand how it was derived uh, so that I could be confident that I was actually placing it in the, red, in the red category instead of making assumptions. Because it's those naive assumptions that we as evasive attackers are trying to take advantage of. So this is kind of what uh, our, our goal is when we are auditing configurations specifically. So we want to go from landing in our target environment uh, where we're shrouded by the fog of war. And so the, by the fog of war, uh, the analogy would be we haven't, uh, we haven't obtained the security configurations in that environment yet. Our goal, ideally, is to obtain that configuration, ideally without getting caught. 
So in that time frame between uh, operating, getting, obtaining situational awareness, and ideally not getting caught, that is inherently a much more high risk environment where we're going to have to prioritize using tradecraft uh, such as, for example, like the uh, generic WIMI evasions, really any generic evasion such that the data source would not even uh, enter or uh, be logged by, by Sysmon. So we need to be mindful of that. The ultimate goal is obtaining the, uh, the specific configuration for that environment. So in Sysmon, you would do sysmon.exe dash C. Now, uh, Dash C provides a, a nice way to parse out uh, the, the rules blob which is contained within the registry. Um, considering we also uh, consider attack surface analysis of Sysmon, uh, I didn't dive into it too much, but I did really need to understand how the binary rules blob in the registry was formed. So I did write a parser for that. Uh, it's a PowerShell module called PS Sysmon Tools. So I, I use that a lot and it offers an alternative way to recover and parse a binary Sysmon configuration. So the, the third step is data, or the third strategy is data collection and implementation analysis. So this entails understanding what the data sources are for, for the collection tool. So that could be an ETW provider, it could be a, a kernel driver, uh, that, a mini filter driver that's uh, queuing up events. Um, and then also understanding how do defenders actually use those event fields when they're building out their detection rules. And then also understanding is the, cl the tool makes a claim and a, a supposed guarantee that it collects all of the data for a field or for a specific event. We need to verify that that collection is correct. All right, so let's talk about the WIMI event event in Sysmon. So our goal is to identify a technique such that WIMI persistence would never be logged in the first place. So we're not talking about evasion in this case. Ideally, we want to tamper with or just bypass uh, that, uh, the ability for Sysmon to collect that data in the first place. So our strategy uh, is pretty simple. We just have to figure out how WIMI persistence is actually, uh, is actually being achieved within the code. So uh, this actually didn't require a ton of reverse engineering. Uh, in this case, I literally just ran strings on Sysmon and saw that uh, the implementation of uh, WIMI persistence uh, is as follows. So this is a uh, WMI uh, query language uh, query, uh, so, or WQL for short. Now when you register uh, WQL event queries, they are going to be specific to uh, WMI namespace. So there's a ton of WMI classes and they're all organized uh, and stored in different namespaces. So um, uh, the reason that this is specific to the root subscription namespace is because, well, that is the most common namespace in which um, the three components of WMI persistence, and that's event filters, event consumers, and filter to consumer bindings would, would live in. So let's parse this out a little bit. So select star, so that refers to give me all properties from an instance operation event, and that is um, the super class of an instance creation, instance modification, and instance deletion event. So this is casting a relatively wide net on WMI persistence on whether you're uh, basically creating or modifying existing, uh, like in the case of modification, modifying existing legitimate uh, WMI persistence, where the target instance is of what WMI class type. Event consumer, so a consumer is uh, where you insert code, so that could be a command line event consumer, so execute PowerShell.exe, whatever. It could be an active script event consumer where you're executing inline Windows script host code like VBScript or JScript. Or the target instance is an event filter. An event filter defines the event that you want to trigger on in the form of something like this, a uh, WQL event query. Or it's a filter cons to consumer binding. This is the thing that binds the filter and consumer together and actually registers the WMI persistence. So I know from previous experience that it's not just the root subscription namespace that these persistence, these WMI persistence artifacts actually live in. They also live in the root default namespace. 
So Microsoft, the developers of Sysmon, just um, happened to neglect this one. Uh, fortunately, that will be a really easy fix for them to implement. They would just put the same uh, event query um, and bind it to the root default namespace. Uh, auto runs has a WMI persistence tab and it already captures root subscription and root default based uh, persistence. So I wouldn't be extremely satisfied with doing WMI persistence on an op using the root default namespace. Well, one, because I'm kind of burning it right here um, and because it's easy to fix. So that may not last forever. So can we do better? Um, so while on our team, we like to come up with, uh, with evasive tradecraft, eventually release it for others to, to build detections off of. Um, but we're always asking ourselves, like, can we do better? So when this technique eventually is burnt and there are mitigations and or security optics for it, we still need to be thinking of the, the latest and greatest things um, so that we can try to win, always be winning the, the cat and mouse game. And that's all this is, it's just a con constant cat and mouse game. So I wanted to know if WMI persistence was possible outside of the existing known uh, w WMI namespaces. So I was reading some documentation and this one came up. And it turns out that every namespace in WMI uh, is automatically populated with system classes. So a system class is any class that starts with underscore underscore three of which are event filter, event consumer, and filter to consumer binding. Now what you don't get are the standard Microsoft event consumers, which would be like active script event consumer, command line event consumer, and, and various others. So that's a problem that we don't have those exposed to us in a non-standard namespace. So what do we do? And just to call out what the goal is here is I would like to perform WMI persistence in any arbitrary namespace if possible because traditional WMI detections up to this point are focused on namespaces. So um, if any namespace could be used then we're going to need to do better with our detection somehow. So we need to figure out how to implement uh, uh, different event consumer classes. So ideally, I'd love to replicate the active script event consumer or command line event consumer in my namespace of choice. So I had to understand the implementation of active, active script event consumers in, in this case. And so where I would start is by looking at a MOF file or a manage object format file. This defines kind of like the schema of WMI classes, methods, properties, and it also gives you some information about how they're registered. So here's the, the definition for ActiveScript event consumer. And what happens next is the consumer is bound to a provider. So in WMI there's a ton of classes which represent data that can be collected, set, or methods that can be executed, but under the hood there needs to be code that can either supply classes with information or execute methods. And so the code that supplies WMI with its functionality is a provider. And these are all um, registered as uh, COM components, these, these providers. And so I saw this and uh, note the CLS ID there, uh, the one that starts with 266. And what happens is the class is bound to that provider. And then the provider itself is registered for that specific namespace. Now just to show you what uh, that particular provider points to in the registry for ActiveScript event consumer, the backing provider is scrcons.exe. This is the component that actually executes the VB script or J script when ActiveScript event consumer is used. So our weaponization strategy is, is as follows. We want to enable an active script event consumer or command line event consumer for any arbitrary namespace. And so I was able to achieve this and you can go to this uh, link. I'll make it a public gist uh, after this talk. And I implemented two PowerShell functions. Uh, and I'll show off the new active script event consumer class. So what this does under the hood is it creates an active script event consumer class using the class name of your choosing. So it doesn't have to actually be named active script event consumer and it will live in any arbitrary namespace you want. So it's going to bypass all of the classic WMI based detections for persistence. So let's dive into a demo here. 
All right, so I've got PowerShell up and running, and what we're gonna do first is just clear out our Sysmon and WIMI operational event logs. I don't want it to be overly populated. Now, I wanna show you the currently running Sysmon config, and all I'm capturing right now are WIMI events. Now, these three WIMI events refer to detections for the creation or modification or deletion of event consumer instances, event filter instances, and filter to consumer binding instances. Now, I'm going to load the code that implements new ActiveScript event consumer, create my class, and notice that the namespace I specified is foo. So this is gonna live in the root foo namespace, and the class is actually called not an ActiveScript event consumer, just to show you that um, you can name it whatever you want. So confirmed that that was created in the root foo namespace. Now we're gonna create a file that our little payload is going to write to. So here's a little VB script payload that we're gonna run. It's just gonna show the, the date time. It's gonna execute every five seconds using uh, an interval timer instruction, or uh, interval time timer class. Uh, select star from timer event where timer ID equals our timer. So the event will trigger every five seconds. And then we're gonna register our event consumer. In this case, our not an active script event consumer class in the foo namespace. And finally, register everything using a filter to consumer binding. So let's run that, get our persistence going in the non-standard namespace. And if everything works out, every five seconds, we should see our payload executing as system. So nothing terribly special about what you're seeing. This is still your classic WMI persistence. The difference being it lives in an arbitrary namespace using an arbitrary class name. Now, just to prove that the, uh, that Sysmon does not capture it, event ID 21 refers to creation, modification, or deletion of filter, uh, filter to consumer binding instances. So we don't have an event for that. If this lived in root subscription, it would have captured it. But fortunately, starting in Windows 10, we have a mitigating detection, which I think is amazing. In the uh, Microsoft Windows WMI Activity Operational Event Log, we get the full context of that persistence. So this is a great way to highlight that Sysmon is very much a supplemental data collection tool. So there will always be other better uh, supplementary event log sources. In this case, if you're in a Windows 10 environment, then you get this one. So this captures the namespace context, the name of the event consumer, the class name of the event consumer, and all of the context related to its registration. So bringing, bringing this back, uh, this is all important in part, this was an important part of the methodology. We're verifying that the data collection tool, it, it said it had a guarantee that it collected WMI event subscriptions, and in this case we verified that that was not quite, quite the case. So highlighting the importance of actually taking that, uh, doing that step in the, in the methodology. The next step that we're gonna do uh, that we performed as part of this was the footprint and an attack surface analysis of Sysmon. So our goal in this is trying to understand what Sysmon uh, adds to the host. So what files, drivers, et cetera. Uh, how does the tool behave during operation? So that's during installation, uh, during its normal use cases, when the configuration is updated, uh, et cetera. And then what resources does the tool depend on? So building out a dependency tree uh, uh, to, to identify if there are any technologies that WM or that Sysmon depends on that we could potentially attack. If we can attack those dependent technologies, then we can subvert, we can potentially subvert Sysmon itself. So we're gonna just focus on one aspect of this just due to time constraints, but uh, we're gonna talk about Sysmon's installation. 
So Sysmon, like, like I mentioned, does not have a centralized way to update or, uh, or install itself. So typically that's either done on a golden image or more often pushed out through a, an IT administration tool. So uh, for example, GPO could be installed through there. Uh, the installation behavior changes depending on which Sysmon binary is used. So when you download Sysmon, there's two executables. There's Sysmon.exe and Sysmon64.exe. Uh, a lot of people just end up using Sysmon.exe because when you run it, it actually extracts the 64-bit version. So Sysmon.exe is the x86 version. And when you run that on a 64-bit system, it'll extract the 64-bit uh, version and execute that instead. So uh, once some of the interesting things that we noticed that it installed on a machine was uh, there, there's various files that it adds. So sysmon.exe and the driver, that's a service, the sysmon service, uh, the user mode service, and the driver component, which does a lot of the collection. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the services for, the, for sysmon and the driver. Uh, there's all the registry keys associated with the service and the driver. Uh, one worth standing out is the uh, parameters registry key, the third one down. Uh, that is where the sysmon configuration file is stored. Um, and as Matt mentioned, it is only accessible by administrators. Uh, non or unprivileged users on a machine cannot access that. Which is fantastic um, that that is locked down like that because um, other things that I think should be locked down, which always aren't, would be like event logs, you know, like the PowerShell event log, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, any uh, non admin user can read that to their heart's content and pull all kinds of interesting information for their situational awareness. Likewise, Sysmon installs an ETW provider from which it uh, reads a bunch of its events, and then it has an event log that, uh, that we can also uh, view and access the events from. So again, the reason why we want to understand what these are, because if we, if I as an attacker can gain control of any of these components, then I can potentially subvert Sysmon as a whole. Yep. And each one of those bullets is a securable object, meaning each one of them will have a security descriptor associated with them. So that would be part of our analysis, is ensuring that, yes, you indeed have to be admin for each one of those components. Yep. And we did verify that for these specific components that you do have to be an administrator. Um, as I was doing this analysis, we did uh, realize a few interesting things. So if you are using the 32-bit the Sysmon on a 64-bit system, uh, that 60, it auto extracts the 64-bit 64 64-bit version of Sysmon to the temp folder. Uh, Usually, uh, IT administration software is running as system, so when this happens, uh, the installer gets written to the C, drive, the C drive Windows temp folder, which, if, which is writable by everybody on the operating system. So as you can see here in this Procmon uh, image, this is during the installer. We can see Sysmon. Uh, it, it starts off this, the x86 version is in C when system32 sysmon, sysmon.exe. After that runs, it extracts the 64-bit version to the temp folder. So this, uh, this, and then it executes it. So I, from an attacker perspective, I have a couple different ways I could abuse this. A very simple one is through DLL hijacking. I can just drop a DLL that sysmon is looking for, and I did verify that there are several. Uh, and then you can, you know, potentially elevate your privileges, privileges to system. Uh, you can also use symlink redirection uh, to, there's a time of check and a time of use uh, type of attack that you can do there that's beyond the scope of this talk. Thanks, but, James. Yeah, big thanks to James Forshaw for that research. In addition to just the installer file itself, uh, when Sysmon uh, is installed, it uses, uh, what do you call it, web, web, winEventUtil.exe to install that, uh, the event log. And how it does this is during installation, it copies a XML manifest to the temp folder. And exploitation of this uh, take, takes a little bit of, a uh, little finesse. So as you can see in this screenshot here, uh, the highlighted items show 
where that file is added. So uh, the first highlighted item at the end, you can see it's dropping it to C, Windows, temp, and then it's called man, and then four numbers, dot temp. So that's going to, Syspawn attempts to, to find a non-existent file, and it uses that same format. So man, four numbers, then dot tmp. Uh, so I had the idea of, well, what if I just exhaust that name, that that character set? So those numbers are always going to be, you know, alphanumeric. So if I add, uh, that's going to be 36 potential characters, 36 to the fourth, because there's four characters. So I wrote 65,535 files to the temp folder, and then removed write access to them, so Sysmon could not write, write to them. And when that happened, an interesting behavior occurred. It always created the file C drive man, or created the file man1.tmp. So at that point, I had a predictable location to where Sysmon was always writing its file. And I could potentially use the uh, James's symlink attack to, re, uh, to gain control over the, the event manifest. So this is interesting because during the installation, it uninstalls the existing, uh, the existing um, event log, and then it will reinstall it. So using this, I could potentially uninstall any event log on the system or abuse that XML file in a bunch of other ways. So what Lee just covered, maybe not the sexiest form of privilege escalation, but it's definitely one of those like lie and wait uh, vectors. Um, but considering, uh, you know, administrators are eventually going to update Sysmon to a later version, as long as you're already embedded and uh, you can lie and wait in C Windows temp, then you'll be good eventually. Uh, another part of attack surface analysis and really just knowing like what is the overall footprint of any security product would be uh, if there is a driver component, the communication mechanism or the, the interface between the service and driver. So the Sysmon driver has an IOCTAL interface. Um, we didn't find anything that would have obviously been exploitable, uh, but we just wanted, we really just wanted to understand uh, what IOCTALs were available and the context of how they were used. So there aren't that, there really aren't any uh, extremely interesting attack scenarios here. Um, there might be a few if you're already admin, um, but we didn't know going into it that we wouldn't find anything fruitful, but we needed to look anyway. Uh, and you, in order to get a handle to the driver, you need to have SE debug privilege. So uh, the set of users and groups who uh, can have SE debug privilege uh, by default will be administrators, uh, but we have seen scenarios where unprivileged users have been added via GPO. Um, to, to acquire SE debug privilege. So now we'll talk about configuration analysis. So I covered a generic evasion, uh, specifically related to WMI, um, but we still want to take a holistic approach to evasion. So uh, we're not, we're not going to have generic evasions for everything. If we did, that'd be great, um, but that is pretty unrealistic. But let's say that we were able to obtain a configuration. Our goal primarily would be to blend in with the noise. And Sysmon lends itself to having an attacker blend in really easily because in Sysmon you can define a bunch of include rules and then exclude rules. And it only takes a single exclude rule for you to completely evade that specific event type. So we're going to use Swift on Securities, uh, canonical Sysmon config. Sorry, I'm not, not picking on you, but uh, it's actually a really good configuration. Um, but it, there are uh, places where we might be able to blend in. So here's our evasion scenario uh, where we possibly obtained the configuration, potentially without even needing to be admin. If the deployment scenario was such that we could obtain the XML on disk, we likely uh, will already have access to that XML. Uh, versus the binary configuration, which is locked down. Uh, or if it was pushed via GPO, we wouldn't have direct access to the binary rules blob, but we would, as a domain user, be able to read that GPO. So this is our plan of attack. We're going to identify the attacker inf influenceable exclude rules and build a overall uh, evasion strategy using those exclude rules. So here are the process create rules that I identified as being interesting. And the reason is uh, one of the uh, 
event conditions that I really like is the contains uh, condition. And that's because I could have anywhere in my command line uh, this thing that will be evaded. So if I have anywhere in my command line acro read 32 and that extra component, then I'll evade all process create rules. Same for file create time. We got another really good contains rule. So setup can be anywhere in the image path. Network connect. We have one is not quite as good, so the file name must be onedrive.exe in order for us to evade network connections. And that's based on the image condition. Process terminate, there weren't any good evasion candidates, so we would have to fall back to uh, like tradecraft avoidance. Uh, and one of the more obvious ones in this case was we'd want to avoid starting a process and terminating it uh, within uh, a path of C, uh, C users. Now driver loads aren't uh, entirely relevant, like in our scenario, uh, where we may not even want to drop drivers, um, but there's still some evasion opportunities, assuming that we could load test signed code. Now create remote thread, I haven't tested this recently, uh, but Casey posted a while ago that there is a generic evasion for create remote thread if you use the Q user APC API. File creates, there weren't really any ideal exclude rules, so we would have to resort to tradecraft avoidance. A registry event. So we can avoid all registry events if our path and file name ends with as follows. Now, the problem is, oh, and we already have a generic evasion for WMI events. So the problem that we've run into is the following. Look at the third and the fourth conditions where the file name would need to end with OneDrive and that path including integrator.exe. So one would evade network connections, the other would avoid uh, registry uh, events. So what we would need to do to have a more holistic evasion would be as follows. So here's one instance of what avoiding or evading most of the rules would look like by combining those exclude rules together. So think about whether or not you would actually be able to detect that in your environment. Uh, and those of you uh, who know PowerShell pretty well might be able to recognize that that is PowerShell running that evades most of these sysmon rules. So our, our conclusions about our analysis of sysmon, again, this was, we were just analyzing it from a data collector perspective. So from a tampering perspective, it's effective against non-administrators. Uh, that's kind of defined. Once you're an admin, uh, all bets are lost. There are no guarantees about an attacker modifying or subverting sysmon. From an attack surface analysis, uh, Sysmon is actually has a, has a pretty small attack surface. Uh, there's a couple weaknesses that I showed with the privilege escalation opportunities, but overall easily fixable. Uh, in terms of evasion, uh, rule enumeration is critical for an attacker in order to do this. Uh, likewise, an attacker could take advantage of just really loud events that typically aren't analyzed, uh, but uh, analyzing that config file is super important for the attacker. Um, in addition, our collection, the collection rules themselves leave us wanting. Uh, they, in specific, the exclude rules because when there is an exclude rule, it is so easy to build an evasion using that. So if there was some way that we could build better collection rules to uh, allow us to ex uh, exclude stuff in a more targeted manner. Uh, overall, you know, Sysmon, it's great. It's a great additional data source for uh, collecting events. Uh, but in order to actually use it, you need supplementary tools. Uh, to, to actually use it for detection purposes within an organization, you need several other tools in order to take advantage of it. So be that log forwarding, uh, and as well as you need, you know, detection engineering. So once you have a sim, actually manually building out those rules to uh, detect attacker activity. Overall, in conclusion, uh, attackers are going to continue to subvert endpoints uh, no matter what. Uh, vendors, we ask the question, are you doing subversion research on your products beyond just attack surface analysis and tam maybe tampering protection? Uh, evasion resilience is a big gap area that we see in the industry uh, and we encourage uh, others to focus efforts on that. Uh, defenders, 
Are you, do you understand the threat model that your products are protect against? Um, and are you aware of how resilient they are to evasion underneath? So uh, we encourage defenders to take this methodology and start applying it to their own products so they can get better insight uh, into the efficacy of their products. Perfect. And thank you all very much. Uh, again, we didn't wear this for nothing, so uh, feel free to, we'd love it if you could donate to the Muscular Dif Dystrophy Association. Uh, we, it means a lot to us, so. Thank you. And we'll take questions in the breakout room.